So when I think about the importance of tech policy, um, it is inclusive of all of the things I think about in good policy setting period. Um, it's also around, I think, the role of companies versus countries, if you will, not to set that up as a conflicting paradigm per se, but since Chris already did upstairs, um, <laughs> really thinking through sort of how do we help navigate those trade-offs and decisions in between so that it's not a headbutting situation, but a more constructive dialogue. Um, so those are probably the few um, considerations I think of in the importance of tech policy. Policy ends up codifying values and norms in our society. So it's also really a test case for how are we actually going to practice our humanity through policy that's going to govern everybody. And in this case, um, AI actually has the potential in the future to challenge us being more fully human. Um, and I think it's really important to try to set uh, good policy around that early in the industry. Uh, what do we need technology policy for? So I think it's really essentially about freedom, at, at least for me, for me it is. I want to know as a, as, a, as a person that I can be free and that others respect my freedom. And so um, there, there need to be rules that define my space where I can master my life. And um, I want to rely on uh, the fact that other people respect that freedom. And so I think that very much applies, well, of course, to any aspect of life, but technology as well, because it imp impacts us so much and it impacts uh, society. So I want to be able to rely um, on rules to be there to tell others how to respect me and also that I know, you know, I can do whatever I want until that certain point. So... Um, I think it's, uh, it's very, I mean, it sounds philosophical, but it's also for a business, from a business point of view, and that's my daily business. It's really to know what we can rely on as a company, um, um, until where can we go and where's the, the, you know, the limit. Yeah. And, uh, it's kind of like safety standards, um, the standards that we, we know we can rely on to be safe or to also that our fundamental rights are safe. Per, uh, technology is very pervasive in our lives. It's not just your telephone, but it's your watch, it's your car, it's your washing machine, it's your home uh, alarm system. All these things uh, are continuing to uh, become more uh, pervasive in our lives, and they're going to continue to uh, with the Internet of Things, uh, billions of devices out there. So we need reasonably good policy uh, to prevent abuse and to prevent that technology from guiding us into a, an autocratic system or some sort of uh, future that we would not want uh, to be in. So uh, I think it's very important that we, we collaborate uh, across business, across academia, government, uh, and, and the thinkers of this world to, to formulate policy that will keep uh, business in, in the right lanes, uh, maybe the left lane too. But um, uh, this is important. And also, it's important for business to know what the rules are so that they can plan ahead, so they can uh, create opportunities, so they can create a future. So uh, from both sides, I think it's very important that we have well thought out, uh, well discussed, and, and agreed upon a collaborated policy. Thank you. Yeah, those are all such great points. And one of the things that each of you touched on is that we need guardrails, we need to be inclusive, we need to make sure that it's not, you know, exacerbating any kind of bias. So I kind of want to dig into that a little bit and ask, like, you know, biases exist in society and AI is basically an amplifier. So if bias exists in society, AI may amplify it. So what are some of the, the guardrails that we can put into place? Like, why is it so important? What can we do? to ensure that uh, AI is ethical, that it that we're not exacerbating those biases? Well, uh, first of all, uh, we need we need diversity in, in the workplace uh, to make sure that the, the people that develop the algorithm, the people that collect the data and decide what is going to be used, how it's going to be used, have different viewpoints and, and not just, I mean, we have a very diverse crowd here today, which I really appreciate, uh, but I have a feeling there's a not a diversity in terms of political philosophy. Uh, we need that as well, uh, and, and I say that with some hesitation, uh, but nonetheless, <laughs> uh, that's, that's the one thing. We also need standards. I mean, we, 
but we need Sanders. We, we need uh, like the, the National Institute of Sanders to have uh, a testing that they can uh, subject algorithms to before they become wide, widely used. Uh, standards for data so that uh, it has less bias uh, than otherwise, and that the biases are uh, documented and understood. Uh, so that when that data gets used to train algorithms, uh, we can have some expectation about what the bias and the results will be. Uh, so uh, those are those are some of the things I think that are going to be very important. Well, well, what do you think? So the only thing I would add to that is um, I'm not entirely convinced that we we can do all of these things. I mean, it's great to have guardrails and checklists and stuff, but ethics and our sense of fairness live inside us, right? They don't live on paper. So until we actually build better human beings and push ourselves um, to be the best that we can be and have the courage to use our technology, because AI is not a self-living and yet uh, thinking thing entirely, it's, it's a tool we create, right? So if we are trying to push ourselves to use it ethically and fairly, then that's the only, I think, consistent way we actually try to accomplish that. Um, those things, which are great, are the risk mitigation counter to when you don't think you can or when you can't to test the you actually you are running some sort of fairness test before you deploy it into the wild. Yeah, of course, it all comes down to who we are as people and that kind of is the whole reason that all tech is human is is called that right because technology is created by humans and for humans and so um, humanity is woven throughout it um sometimes though humans have really great intentions and they they do have good hearts but they're they don't really think about the unintended consequences they're um sometimes algorithms are very much a black box and people aren't anticipating you know what they don't even know all the factors and considerations that the AI is thinking about. So what are your thoughts on like uh, algorithm transparency? Do you feel like we should know exactly what factors are going into this, uh, into the algorithms that are creating our world? Well, you're looking at me. Yeah, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, uh, there needs to be some transparency as much as possible, really. Uh, and you mentioned uh, the sort of degrees of freedom that algorithms have. I mean, as human beings, we have six senses, or five, uh, and um, it, it really, there's things we understand that are beyond our, our sensory perception, but um, algorithms can, can have hundreds or thousands of degrees of freedom. So there's things that they will uh, identify in data that we wouldn't understand or identify. So that's gonna be difficult. And uh, can we create standards for that? I mean, I, I don't, I don't know that, I don't know that we can, but we have to have some guardrails because, uh, I mean, it, it, it's good that humans are ethical, at least some of us, but there's some that are not going to be ethical and they're going to use, uh, artificial intelligence in, in nefarious ways. And so there has to be some guardrails or standards or, or uh, a way to identify when, when, when we do get in trouble in that regard. So if I may, I think there are a couple of things I would add, um, and we have a lot of these conversations. So the AI expert I work with at Socos Labs, Dr. Vivian Ming, um, was one of the first AI experts to call for AI as a human right a um, year and a half ago. And I think the concept behind that is that if someone is designing an algorithm that is making decisions about you, um, using your data, and without your consent, you, they are literally capable of violating your civil rights. Um, with you having no judicial review or redress, right? Which is literally a violation of our civil rights under US Constitution law. So if, if someone was doing that face to face to you in an interview or in court, you could call them out, right? You can call a witness. If you can't call AI as a witness, um, or counter with your own AI as a rebuttal witness, that is a violation of your civil rights. So that's how we think about transparency at Socos. Um, one of the things we've sort of toyed and, you know, it's it's not necessarily actually um, a policy push at the moment for sure, but how do we think about um, protection similar to how we think about the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau? Um, is there a future CTPB for technology protection for consumer um, privacy and, and transparency? Um, who knows, right? But if we can't and we're probably not capable of entire self-regulation, then what are the responses to that to really make sure that our civil rights and human rights are protected? 
And I'm curious to know uh, what everyone here thinks about who should be responsible when there is some kind of unintended consequence. So there have been you know, scenarios out there whose example would be a self-driving car. So if the car you know, hits a pedestrian, injures the pedestrian, who's responsible? Um, and I'd actually like to see a show of hands on this just to kind of pull the audience and see what you all think as well. But should it be, and you can just raise your hand whenever I say the one you, the organization or the person you think should be responsible, should it be the industry that is overseeing or the organization overseeing the industry, so like the industry body? Should it be the actual company? So a few hands think it should be the company. Should it be the developers who designed it? Have one person, one person <laughs> for all of them. Or should it be the driver who is in the car? Maybe they could have pushed the stop button. Okay, so a couple, three people think it should have, or think it should have been. So to our panelists, what do you think? Uh, where does that responsibility lie? Who should be held accountable for um, any kind of mistakes that AI makes that are damaging to society? <laughs> well, I mean, the thing is, um, AI, I think AI and ethics are almost completely inseparable. Um, every step of the way in, is going to involve human interaction. The people that have uh, designed the algorithm, the people that hire the people that design the algorithm, the people that collect the data, the police, people that release the data, and the people that use the data. Uh, I mean, every step along the way, there's people that, that have a share in the responsibility. And so, uh, it, sh it depends on the individual case. If you have, for example, you mentioned a, a self-driving car. Um, in that case, it's pretty clear to me that the courts are going to side uh, against the company that developed the car. And so I think that's, I don't know if that's obvious or not to everybody, but that's what I think the courts would decide. Uh, so we, we could develop standards to, to decide where these responsibility lies in, in classes of, of cases. Uh, and I uh, appreciate some of the comments have already been made in terms of helping me understand where we should go uh, in terms of assigning responsibilities. Uh, who's who's going who's gonna to stand up when these things start going wrong? So what I would add to that is I agree. I think it's a combination of developers and corporate officers. And the reason for that is because when an AI works well, who stands to profit from it, right? So the converse should be equally true. If we invest billions of dollars in creating AI and leveraging the profits off of it, those same people should be held responsible when things go wrong and their pocketbooks should be hurt for them to learn some version of a lesson. Um, and I hate that kind of thinking because that's risk mitigation that's like bottom of the totem pole of how we should be functioning as a society. Um, one of the things I've learned to think from my corporate social innovation background and I teach at NYU is how we think about using potentially sustainability standards and sustainability thinking in what we might bring into the AI ethics space. So one of the models I love there is around ESG frameworks, called environmental, social, and governance factors, and how a company behaves, um, and how it increasingly gets you to think about the potential harm, um, population harm, environmental harm, social harm, of what you're designing and deploying before you do so. So that, like, let's say, for example, you're Levi's and you're thinking about the dirty water you're going to put out from your factory and who gets to pay for the cost of that cleanup, right? It's probably not so far been you. It's been that country, that region, that state, city, whatever, cleaning up the water for people to drink downstream. What if you had to internalize the cost of cleaning up that water onto your balance sheet? You're going to design those jeans really fucking differently. Am I allowed to swear? Sorry. <laughs> yes, Congressman absolutely. on the panel. <laughs> button up here. Um, so how would you think about that differently if you had to internalize the costs? How would you design the genes differently? How would you design your factory differently? So I think similarly, I'd be really curious for us to think about how we use that kind of design thinking into the AI ethics space. Um, there's a great body called the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, sound as wonky as it is, but they have created sustainability standards for every industry and sector out there I'd love for this to be, I'm putting it out there now, I'd love for this to be one of the things that we tackle next with them. That was amazing. Congressman, what do you think about that? And especially what she mentioned about the sustainable standards and kind of using that as like a parallel. Oh, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> They're already registered to the SEC, and so are all the companies that we're talking about. 
Well, I mean, there, there's a, a, a B Corp uh, yeah. system out there, and mm -hmm. uh, I think that should be a part of it. What I'm uh, looking for is developing legislation to create a national registry for B Corps, to judge them, and also include a CEO to average worker pay ratio, and um, yeah. Woo! the uh, uh, tons of carbon produced per uh, per thousand dollars of profit. I mean, there's, there's, there's things that we can do that, that'll, that'll make us move in that direction. And I, I think it's our ethical duty to try to do that. <laughs> I see a uh, room here for potential collaboration in the future. This is amazing. So I want to pivot a little bit now, um, and talk a lot about privacy. Uh, Congressman, I know you work extensively on privacy. Julia, you have a very strong background in this. Um, so we had, you know, G GDPR rollout. We had, you know, Congressman here from California. We had the California Consumer Privacy Act that's going to be starting to be implemented in January of next year. What are your thoughts on whether the United States should have a national privacy policy similar to the two we just mentioned? Uh, Julia, do you want to start out? Yeah. The non-American on the panel, right? <laughs> <laughs> well. Um, I think that would be very important. And I'm not only talking about, you know, your rights being respected and, uh, and enshrined somewhere, um, your right to privacy, because, um, I do think that there, you know, it needs to be more like, there needs to be more awareness around that, that like human beings have a right to privacy. So I'm not only talking about that, but from a business point of view, I, um, you know, GDPR is out there and, um, and a lot of companies who have, uh, you know, operations in Europe, uh, but uh, who, that are based here are my clients and they, uh, they worked hard on, you know, complying with those rules, uh, for their European market. And, um, and what they always tell me is that really the level playing field is important. So, um, they want to, for them, best thing is if, they had to adopt those rules internally once and for all. And if like the easiest for them would be if they could rely on that, uh, those operations, internal operations, uh, to, to be the same for other markets as well. So, um, <laughs> the GDPR in Europe was really created so we could have the same, um, the same rules for 28 countries that share one single market. And, uh, it's really funny that now the U.S. are going in the other direction. So, um, we made all that work in Europe, uh, to, to have, you know, to make it easier for companies to, to operate on different markets, uh, or, I mean, one single market, but in different countries with the same rules. And here, um, because the federal level, uh, you could probably say more about that later, um, is unable to, uh, to create those rules for all Americans. Um, the states felt obliged because, you know, people claim those rights and people, there, there seems, I mean, there's research saying that Americans do feel strong about their pri privacy and they want more rules around that. So the states feel obliged to, you know, make policies. And, um, I, I mean, as, as much as I, I, I'm, I really think that California, uh, it was the right choice, of course, to, uh, to work on a law here, uh, but it would have been better if, there was a U.S. law even before CCPA um, comes into effect next year because it would be easier for companies um, to to have the same rules all over the country, uh, let alone in other places of the world. Right. Yeah. So you're seeing GDPR be nice if there is a U.S. law to kind of complement that, or so companies could have the same type of policies and. Well, I, I should add one thing. So I don't, I don't think that every country, I mean, the U.S. need to have their own privacy right. I mean, a lot of the rules in the GDPR sound very or feel very European and, uh, don't feel natural to a lot of Americans. And, uh, I think that is very important, uh, you know, that you here have your own discussion around that. Um, and, um, and, but, uh, from a business point of view, honestly, uh, I think, if there was a U.S. law, um, it would be easiest if it was the most similar possible because of the level playing field. Right. Yeah. Congressman, what do you think? Well, we clearly need a, a privacy law in this country. Uh, people have people know that their data is gone and they don't have control over it. They're worried about it. They see impacts of that, whether it's a loss of personal freedom, 
uh, Julie mentioned. But uh, the thing is, California created a, a CCPA. We're working on one in, in our committee of jurisdiction, uh, the Consumer Protection Subcommittee. Um, each member of the committee has a specific assignment with regard to responsibility on developing that legislation. Mine is data minimization. Uh, uh, companies shouldn't take more data than they need. Uh, and the other is data security. In my responsibility, uh, make sure that, that the, once a company has data, that it, it, it encrypts it or has some other sort of security. So we're going to move forward creating that now. Um, on the other side of the aisle, uh, politically speaking, uh, their chief focus is preemption, which uh, they'd like to see federal law preempt all other states. And uh, there's a point to that, but uh, I mean, California has a good, strong uh, privacy law. It's going to be coming into effect in January. I can't come home to my constituents and say, hey, you know, I voted to weaken your privacy protection. I just can't do that. Yeah. And so uh, I'm going to fight uh, to have California exempted from the, uh, from the privacy laws if they're, if they're weaker. And that kind of reminds you of something else that's happening right now, doesn't it? Absolutely. Or should I bring that up? Well, uh, I mean, <laughs> uh, the the, uh, the federal government and the uh, EPA has announced they're going to roll back California's tailpipe emission standards, uh, and and that is an example. California was given an exception, uh, and that exception has allowed California to set standards that have applied to the rest of the country, and our our automobiles are cleaner as a result. Uh, that was done by uh, collaboration between President Nixon and Governor Ronald Reagan, and so. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going off this. <laughs> it's a it's a topic that brings up a lot of emotions because it has such strong, such enormous impact on the environment we live in. And so, you know, I mean, California is doing an amazing job of putting forward really progressive, you know, laws that then other states adopt and sometimes they're adopted at the national level. So it is really hard, you know, when the national uh, government tries to come in and kind of. Uh, undermine some of the laws that Californians have created. So, uh, Julia, one of the things that you mentioned was that, you know, it's easier from a business perspective for the U.S. you know privacy laws to be similar to the ones in the GDPR. Um, but, of course, it needs to reflect the country and the citizens and all of the, the beliefs and values there. Um, what are some ways that industry and government can work together to create really solid regulation. It's kind of a win-win for, for both, representing the people fairly and also good for business and global companies. Yeah, great question. So I, I do think that it's really great that a lot of companies are becoming aware of their responsibility and that they also work on internal guidelines, ethical guidelines um, to, uh, to work with the dilemma they're often in and that they also um, that a lot, a lot of times employees of those same companies, uh, you know, mentioned that or, you know, became really, um, vocal about the, the responsibility that they feel when creating a product that they're not really, like, they don't really know how safe the impact is on, on people. Uh, so I think that's a great thing. One thing that I, or two things actually that I think are important with that is, first of all, um, so I think those ethical guidelines are great, but they, they create very fragmented situation and there I'm back at you know my point about uh, the level playing field I think it's important for consumers and citizens to know um like you know all of those companies just play by the rules and so I can rely on that um so those guidelines are are separate for each uh, company so far and uh, there's no real enforceability so i mean there's no way to as a consumer or a client or a, or a person to to have a right to re uh, redress and I, I think that's also my um my criticism of one of my criticisms but uh, on CP ccpa is that enforceability like will it really be possible to enforce this law with the you know attorney general who has a very small team and um well, the, the fines are also much lower. Um, I think there's really a lack of manpower to enforce this law. Uh, and it's also too complicated <laughs> to really understand. So um, enforceability is a very important point for me. And there, I mean, that's kind of the role of politi politics to make sure 
um, and then of the enforcing bodies that uh, rules are respected. That's like a, in a family, you know, when you, you can interact freely and uh, build up trust when you know that there are certain principles in a family and that those principles are not only like said, but like enforced. I think that makes you trust and that makes you act freely. Yeah, those are excellent points. Congressman, what do you think? Like from the government perspective, what are some of the best ways for industry, for companies to work together with government when creating you know, regulations for the US and to Julia's point um, about enforcement, like what are your thoughts on uh, national enforcement whenever those, uh, that legislation rolls out? Well, um, I'd like to follow up a little bit. Uh, this is a California law, the CCPI, I don't have any jurisdiction, but I think what's gonna happen is it has its flaws and as it moves through uh, in, uh, enactment and enforcement, there's going to be modifications to it to make it a better law. And I think that's that's part of the process. And I, I like to see that happen. Um, but getting industry and, and government together is really critical. And uh, I, I can tell you an experience I had uh, back in uh, 2008. I visited one of the big tech companies here in Silicon Valley. And they, they told me, hey, you know, just get out of our way with privacy. You know, we know what we're doing. You know, you, we don't need government interference. But you guys are just a big part of the problem. You know, get out of the way. And then the next year, Safe Harbor Act was passed in Europe, and they called me and said, hey, Congressman, why don't we sit down and talk about privacy? So, I mean, it's in everybody's interest to have good rules. Uh, and, and another, I mean, if you all are football fans, you know, if you if you play football and the, and the field is all bumpy and the lines aren't straight and the referees don't know what they're doing, I mean, it's a terrible, chaotic situation. What we need is is good, well thought out uh, regulations and, and enforced so that people know what to expect so that government uh, and, and uh, can sort of step back and, and let industry do its thing. And, and in that case, I think everybody prospers. So it's really in, in the industry's interest to work with uh, policymakers. And I invite that. I, I take um, tech tours about four or five times a year, talk to the industry and get their feedback and input. And that's that's been very useful. Uh, and uh, I hope we continue to do that. Can I jump in? So um, one of the models that I'm a big fan of in any new industry and figuring out responsible policy, having set equal time in my career in DC and Silicon Valley now, um, is something called the regulatory sandbox. I don't know how many people are familiar with this. Um, I was working in the end of the Obama administration to try to bring the fintech regulatory sandbox to the US. The UK and Singapore have done it in case anyone wants to look up models. Um, there's always criticism of every policy in terms of does it actually promote innovation or stifle it. But the purpose of a regulatory sandbox is um, in a new industry, in this case, let's say AI, for regulation to be set adaptive and with industry together, um, you enter, you apply to be in the sandbox, uh, where as an innovator, you have the chance to see what your algorithms can do who you might impact before you release it into the wild. And at the same time, the legislators have an inside view into how it's being designed, um, understanding sort of who the use cases are, how you might reach those consumers, what data do you actually need, data minimization, what data are you not, do you not need and not need to sort of boil the ocean with, um, so that when there is regulation set, when we draft legislation is as adaptive, agile, responsive to the industry that is um, emerging as possible and that it's set together um, so that it is more enforceable, it's more collegial and it's less of that headbutting. Um, I know the Singapore is certainly considering its version of an AI regulatory sandbox at the moment, whether or not they actually call it that. Um, uh, the UK has got their own draft AI policy out, but it's a model that I think is really interesting. Um, the other model I'd love to see us try to explore, very Silicon Valley-esque perhaps, is data trusts. How do we use data trusts to solve problems using all of this incredible expertise we have um, with engineers and data scientists that the social good that let's say government hasn't been able to solve yet, right? Government has tons of data in every industry, every um, minute at every department, um, let's say, how do we try to create um, cooperative environments like sort of the open source community has, um, where we put out problems we can't yet solve and try to get 
a more collaborative culture to try to set solve those problems using what data we already have and not constantly have everybody collect more data. Um, it's those are probably a couple of models I'd love to see um, explored in how we think about companies and governments working together in in this space. Those are two very fascinating models. Have we done anything similar in the U.S. ever? No. I really like the regulatory sandbox idea. Um, Congressman, do you have anything that you'd like to comment on in regards to that at all? Well, I look forward to collaborating with you on this. Do <laughs> <laughs> it. Um, that would be absolutely incredible. Uh, you know, whenever a company is going to roll out a product, they always have, you know, uh, a little bit of that sandbox too. And so it would be awesome. You know, regulations coming down from the government, but it'd also be great if government could innovate and learn from Silicon Valley too. Um, together, we can, you know. Together. Stronger together. Stronger together, yeah. <laughs> As Hillary would say. Um, and I didn't then, say her name. <laughs> and then one thing that we have seen is a lot of technology coming out of the US. And, we, and then we've seen a lot of regulation coming out of Europe with GDPR. Are we headed towards this kind of bipolar world where the U.S. is like creating the technology and Europe comes in and is, is regulating it? Uh, Julia, what do you think? Yeah, okay. Um, interesting question. Um, I, I was born in a bipolar world and my country uh, got reunified after the end of that bipolar world. But um, so, yeah, coming to your question, interesting. Um, I... It's true that uh, Europe has uh, issued quite some regulation around technology and is about like not only GDPR, but they're also working on other um, norm setting rules. And um, of course, when you're the first to issue um, a framework that kind of makes sense and that seems to be enforced, um, you become um, like a global norm setter, um, um, a trend setter, norm setter, yeah. Um, but I, I don't think um, Europe chose that role. I think they would have also liked to be in this position of uh, uh, producing great technology and being uh, being ahead of that. Um, uh, I, <laughs> for a lot of reasons, uh, a lot of the the technology actually comes from the U.S. from here. Um, but there's an absence in leadership uh, from the U.S. I think to to create those rules um, as well. Uh, so, you know, when you, when you, it's of course, uh, you know, there are different actors that we're talking about, companies, uh, developers, and um, and then on the other hand, government. Um, but I do think that there's an absence, there's a vacuum, globally a vacuum in rule setting, um, in smart rule setting, I should say, uh, around technology and just, Europe just stepped in and 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 did that first because nobody else did it um, and um, so I repeat my point I do think that uh, the US should also be leading in that and uh, uh, because we share values I mean we're really the democ big de democracies in the world uh, with uh, you know over 500 million people in the EU and then of course the American population we're kind of you know we we have those fundamental rights that are this, we believe in more or less the same values. And I think that's where, um, where California comes in. Uh, uh, so I, I mentioned earlier that, um, I'm part of a group, um, that worked on a, works on a, ch a charter for fundamental digital rights in Europe. And, uh, so they're coming to, uh, the main initiators, uh, are coming to California next month to discuss this charter and see if it's maybe applicable in, in, or can it can be used in, in California law because we share values and um, California is, is ready to act, I think. Uh, so uh, I think that the US, I mean, well, California and Europe should, um, should be allies um, because other places in the world don't have our same uh, values and they're acting faster than we are. We really have to, um, you know, act and be, be fast. And I, I really, um, hope that California will be a big um, proponent of that in the U.S. Yeah. yeah. Um, so one thing I would add to that is the perhaps other places Julia was mentioning. Um, there's certainly other countries that have AI national strategies, China, even India uh, now in the last few months. 
And I think the question comes down to while we're focusing on US and Europe, who's going to get the best tech and who's going to have the best regulation? Um, others are setting their own tech and regulation, right? So uh, if we want to have more consistent, let's say, human rights standards and applied um, AI and applied technology, it's not going to stay in one country, right? Technology doesn't do that. Internet's global. AI is going to be global. Um, so who do we see as fully human and how do you treat those that you don't see as fully human? Um, goes back to why, <laughs> so cheesy, but why the UN was created, right? Like, why do we have international human rights standards? It's because we want to try to see humans as human no matter where they are. Are human rights standards as they currently exist good enough in the age of AI? I don't know, but it would be fantastic. I hope so. It would be fantastic if we think about a more global constitutional level of AI and ethics um, that applies uniformly across all humans, wherever we may find them. Um, otherwise, you're going to go back to the same kind of fighting on the Human Rights Council that we have now, which maybe isn't the great model for <laughs> applying um, AI ethics. Um, but I can't think of trusting any one country. I guess there's the teeny libertarian inside me um, that uh, has a hard time trusting any one country's regulation when it comes to a global technology. Thank you. Uh, there's some really good issues that have come up here. Um, first of all, values. Julia brought this one up. Um, and we have values in this country, and uh, our competitors uh, across the Pacific have, may have a different set of values. Uh, specifically, on Americans and Europeans, we value our privacy. In China, privacy, they have a ton of data. Privacy uh, is not an issue. You can gather the data, and you can use it any way you want it. And those uh, those values are going to be incorporated into products that come out of that part of the world. And if they, and this motivates me, I mean, if they are the world leaders in, in producing AI, uh, producing it cheaply, marketing it worldwide, then those values are going to be uh, incorporated worldwide. So if we value our values of privacy, then we have to be competitive. We have to put a uh, product out there that uh, is competitive uh, in, in order to have our values incorporated instead of theirs. So I think that's one of the major challenges that we have right now. How do we go about that? And then uh, another issue is uh, uh, an AI plan for the future. And I'm proud to say uh, our city of Stockton, California has an AI plan for the future. And we're going to try uh, the best we can to prepare our populace, which is very susceptible to AI job displacement, uh, by job training, by up up educating, uh, and providing all the programs we need, and maybe um, enticing some Silicon Valley companies out into our way. But uh, there's a real feeling that we need to do that, and that it's happening. And I think it's the first city in the world to do that. Congratulations. That's uh, very forward thinking and impressive to think about how it's going to impact your constituents. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left. And so I want to get to some audience questions in a second. But first, I'm going to ask the panel just kind of a, a final wrap up question here. So what is one important action that anyone in this room could take, um, which I know is difficult because people come from all sorts of backgrounds and have all sorts of types of jobs. But what is any one action that the people who are here could take to help ensure that AI um, stays ethical or becomes ethical in its future development? Who would like to go first? I can. OK. <laughs> <laughs> I think, well, everybody is a decision maker. Uh, I think that's really important. Uh, we, well, it was mentioned in a previous um, um, panel, but I, we should really never stop talking about these issues and talk publicly and we have through social media a lot of ways to talk publicly about these um these issues and to take a stance um and uh, taking a stance also means a vote <laughs> i think that's really important at this point of um time um because uh, i think the worst would really be and a lot of people do that um because they are so aware of the of the speed that technology is developing uh, and what impact it has that they withdraw out of fear. And I think this re withdrawal is really, really um, risky and dangerous. Uh, so uh, participate in discussions, participate in political decision making. I think that's essential. Um, and then, of course, I'm saying that also um, here. Um, I think a close partnership with Europe is important. 
because there's a lot of like-minded people there and uh, one can do that through you know um, non-profits or through other ways of you know um, working together because we share values um, yeah so I would agree I would add a, whether you're a developer designer whatever role it is you play I think having the courage to choose to use technology whatever it is AI is a technology right um, it's a tool it's not uh, it yet, again, a brain of its own. Um, we have to choose to use it to promote humanity and not just for our own financial gains. Um, so whatever role it is you play, you certainly have that potential. I'm chairman of the AI caucus in the House of Representatives, and I see my role is to educate members of Congress about AI. It seems scary. It seems like it's going to dehumanize society. It's going to displace 40 million workers, and that's, that's uh, I mean, there's a lot of nuance in this field, and so just educating my colleagues is going to be very important, and my staff, and everybody's staff, but uh, that should be something that we look at in terms of AI. How can we make sure that there's a, a sort of an accurate perception out there of what AI is? It, it's not some machine, it's not HAL in, in uh, 2001, it, it's not that, I mean, there, there's... It, it's going to displace some jobs. It's going to create jobs. It's create prosperity. It can make our lives better. But if we don't get ahead of it, uh, then it could make our lives worse. So uh, I think we have a real challenge in terms of um, helping educate the public about what this incredible field means. Yeah, that is very true. And is there any particular method of education that you found particularly helpful as you're trying to do that? Here. <laughs> and on that note, um, let's uh, take some questions from the audience. Um, so many hands. Okay, excellent. So what we're going to do, uh, first of all, make sure it's a question. So make sure it ends with a question mark. Um, and it's the thing. And then we're going to have somebody who will hold a microphone. Okay, yes. Um, so we'll give you a microphone. And... Um, Let's see. I'll just, there are so many hands if you just want to run around uh, and pass the microphone off. And then I'm going to collect two or three questions and then we'll take it two or three at a time and, and dish them out to the panel. Yeah. No, you can go ahead and go over to them. That's fine. Hello. Okay. Yeah, um, thank you so much. Julia, you mentioned um, the preemption of state laws for data privacy regulation. Um, one concern I have with this is that technology is extremely rapidly evolving and we're constantly um, obtaining new methods and new technologies. And sometimes with these new innovations, we don't really understand what the best way to regulate them actually is. So I believe that state regulations can often be a way to experiment with these new technologies before we construct a um, regulatory policy that we're locked into on a national scale. So I was wondering um, what your thoughts were about that and the preemption of state laws. Okay, um, we'll collect a couple other questions real quick. Thank you for that. Kind of goes to Vogel's point about a uh, sandbox. Hello, I'm Stephen Teal at Accenture. I'm curious. You know, we've seen with the CCPA, which really came about because of a ballot initiative that kind of got taken out of that situation because it could have been really difficult to change later. But then we see San Francisco legislation about surveillance that can also be very difficult to change later. And what we continue to see is that voters are going to vote for privacy no matter what form it comes in. And there are attendant risks to that because we might figure out things like, oh, if we don't have surveillance as part of our police force, it becomes a sanctuary city for crime, for instance, right? Maybe 10, 15 years in the future. And so how can we be proactive in such a way where we're not having all of these thousand flowers of privacy legislation bloom where maybe the, the, the ideas aren't really thought out too well that would survive 20 years in the future. Okay, excellent question. Let's take one more. Um, my question is around how do we deal with the tensions around um, 
countries not lagging behind or falling behind in the innovation space when we talk about uh, regulations. Um, and this is coming from the space of, uh, so 5G technology, for instance, you know, World War 5G is not really about 5G per se, it's about the fact that the United States lost um, in the leadership in, in that space. And we're seeing that happening in the AI world as well because these other countries have the ability to collect data, train system systems, move fast, and create. And then while the US and Europe is busy trying to regulate, meanwhile lagging behind in the innovation space. So how do we play with that tension? Okay, thank you for that. Um, so let's start out with these questions. And um, we'll start out with the first one where we were talking about um, how state laws are kind of like a little bit of a sandbox for for uh, more national legislation. Julia, did you have something you want to say about that? And then Global, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that too. Yeah. Well, two points maybe. Um, I, I you're totally right that um, testing a law and um, and seeing you know working with lessons learned is really important and can be very useful. Um, I would wish to see some of that already. And I, I, it, it is already part of the um, the legislation process. So I mean, there's a lot of lobby groups uh, of all different kinds uh, working on laws in every state, of course. So there's a way already in that before a law even comes into effect to 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 you know combine different points of view and so on. Um, I do think you're right when it's a very small state. Uh, California, I think, I mean, it would be part of the G7, G8 if it was a separate uh, country. Um, I think a law that comes into effect here, and it will be the case on January 1st next year, um, this, uh, the, the um, California Privacy Act, um, that is already a different thing. And I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to see that there will be, you know, improvement on the law when it's already in effect, but um, but I think it already has a very big impact uh, on companies. And there, I'm back at my point. I think for companies, it's really important to know what you can expect, even not just next month, but ahead of time, like several years in advance. I mean, that's not always possible in technology, of course, but like at least you know where the train is heading to. Yeah. Okay, and then um, let's just kind of wrap up the the other two questions kind of at the same time, and Congressman can use my microphone. But there was, you know, the comment about voters will always vote for privacy, what can we do there? And then also, um, how do we make sure that all the countries are kind of like staying and nobody is lagging behind in terms of like policy regulation? Um, what would you want to say? Sure. Um, so San Francisco and states, I'm a big fan of experimentation. Um, I realize that this has the potential to experiment in a poor, bad, harmful way, um, but and not to beat the sandbox idea into the ground, whatever the appropriate analogy is there. Um, <laughs> it sounds like a weird playground analogy. Um, but experimentation, right? So what will work for what context, kind of like we think about product market fit, um, what will work for which context? What is the right technology for the right use case at the right time? Um, I think states and cities should be experimenting to some extent with some basic common denominator of protection for harm, right? How we think about harm, privacy, safety. Um, San Francisco has a committee, the mayor's office is a committee on information technology that's thinking through these ethical use standards for sure. Um, the California governor's office is now starting to think about these, the new governor's office is now starting to think about these things for sure. So. I think some experimentation is good to see how that helps us set more responsive, agile, and adaptive legislation at the national and then ideally international level is should come from that experimentation and lessons learned. Well, um, I think one of the one of the tensions, and I think uh, Stephen mentioned this, is that uh, we have all all these different ideas about how to regulate, and the different states could uh, enact their own uh, laws. And uh, that would be problematic uh, because then we really would need federal preemption and, and a federal law that, that overran all. So there is an urgency to do a federal law, even though the, um, those ideas haven't been fleshed out in the marketplace very well yet. And uh, unfortunately, the federal government is very hard uh, to modify and change laws once they're enacted because it's a big system and a lot of inertia. So 
we're hoping we get it, it right uh, as well as, as we can. Um, and uh, certainly our input from, from folks uh, is, is valued. Um, and then there's uh, the tension you mentioned uh, about um, other countries competing and giving other countries an opportunity to be part of this space, uh, but not allowing them to use whatever uh, unfair market advantage that they may have in order to win. And I think uh, that, that puts us in, in a very difficult spot. But you know what? It's Silicon Valley, right? I mean, you you guys can stand up uh, to these challenges. I've seen it uh, many times. So I'm not too, too worried about that because uh, if you look at what's happening, uh, you know, in China, it's, it's becoming a, a, a state where you get watched all the time. And people in China don't like that, I don't think, any more than we do. So there's going to be uh, sort of uh, a backlash in that regard, too. So. We want to follow a very, uh, a very good path that the people of this country support, and I think we'll, we'll end up in the winning spot. But we need to work hard to get there. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for coming to this panel, and can you give a warm round of applause for um, our amazing panelists? And then I believe lunch is ready back here. So thank you all. Thank you.